But I understand that the local authorities are being saddled with any risk involved in that. If you have a budget, if you come across abnormal costs, that you have to, uh, to take that on. And is that, is that, in a way, making this uh, less attractive to the local authorities? That's the first question. And as well as that, if that threshold was raised to, we we'll say, 5 million, with maybe 40 units as a base unit, would it help, help matters? Um, th that's the first question I have. And I'm just going back then to the, the generally around the country, um, do we know from each local authority how many voids exist in each local authority, in each county, and what is the cost of refurbishment of these units? Because I believe that's the first step in an emergency situation to get houses back in, in place. Um, do we know what, what the potential for infill sites there are in towns and cities around, around the country that can be bought, bought by the local authority and uh, erect houses in them? And you mentioned there about 22,000 uh, sites that have planning in the greater Dublin area. Is that what you said, uh, Dick? Uh, they have planning, right? They have the part eight. So uh, is, is, when you say that there's 22,000 sites May I just to clarify that that's planning permission, uh, that's com commercial private planning permission through the normal planning right. process. Okay. It's not part eight. No, but what I want to know is how much zone land is in the grasp of the public sector, the public lo local authorities, and how much of that has planning permission and how much of that is serviced and how much of that is what I would call shovel ready in order to get uh, tenders out on it. Do we have that information available across the counties? Or has it been collated by the department or whatever? I suppose uh, I have a few other uh, uh, questions for you. Is that the idea of making, um, which was done in the past, where the local authority would have land and they would service the sites and make them available to individuals to build their old houses, is that an option and would that speed up the process? Um, the other thing that I have a book bear with, and I just want to get your opinion on it, when we go back and talk about voids, I believe that one of the problems we have is estate management. And I've seen examples of where estates are managed good, good and proper and where they're not. And the voids develop fairly fast where there's no good estate management. Have you any uh, proposals or any suggestions to us on how to improve uh, the estate management? I know it's a resource issue, but I think it pays for itself in the long term. And uh, I suppose the last thing I would say to you is that do you have a concern in relation to the fact that private property uh, developers or house builders are buying up land, especially in the greater Dublin area, and one particular house builder has in excess of 20% of that land bought, and that he may actually, or that company is raising money in the stock exchange in London to buy the land here on the basis, I presume, that they would wait for a, a, a greater scarcity, land values to go up, and is there any suggestions you have on how we could contain that as legislators? Thanks very much. Chairman, just, uh, just to answer some of the, the questions, in relation to the, the 2 million and the 15 units, uh, we would be quite happy with that, um, that that is, um, it, it certainly it will speed up things in terms of the smaller packages of units, which applies to most local authorities, and in terms of the risk, if there are, um, the local authorities have to manage that, but if there are, you know, unforeseen risks in terms of ground conditions that are just, you know, couldn't be foreseen, well, then we will have an opportunity to go back to the, to the um, department in that regard. I wouldn't see a huge benefit in increasing the cap beyond uh, up to the figure that you stated at this stage, um, but it's something I'm sure that as we progress we'll, we'll be looking at. In terms of the opportunities that present themselves in towns and villages around the country, derelict sites that are there serviced, uh, no contributions, and there are opportunities there, and we are looking at that, and the department will look very favourably on proposals that we bring to them on the basis of need, provided there's a need there. In relation to your comments, uh, in relation to some uh, land developers holding land and maybe waiting for the market to improve, I can't comment on that, but um, I can comment on that. Um, but certainly, there, there, the, you know, there, there is, uh, land is being held up. There's no question about that. For whatever reason, I don't know. In relation to proprietary estate management, certainly there are things we can do there, and I'll ask uh, Dick, uh, Billy, 
Billy, to comment on that and how we might deal with that. Um, yeah, in, in relation to uh, vacant units and voids, I think it's important to recall that between 2014 and 2015, 5,000 units across the country were brought back in to stock and tenant to a program uh, with, with finance assistance from the Department of the Environment. Nobody wants to see voids in their area. Uh, some local authorities are very good in managing that for a number of reasons. And there are some, unfortunately, small number of local authorities that do struggle with it. And again, for a variety of unique reasons for those areas. But it is important, quick turnaround. And I think the turnaround is, is, has improved hugely across uh, all the local authorities uh, nationally. In terms of antisocial behavior, you're going to get it. I don't know if voids do tend to be a magnet for antisocial behaviour because it's a gathering point. Uh, and for that reason, every effort is made to bring those back in uh, into tenancy uh, where at all possible. Antisocial behaviour, there are greater powers now resting with local authorities to deal with that, even though there's a whole process attached to it in terms of warning letters, uh, rights of appeal and all of that, but at least it's a streamlined process that everyone can follow. Thank you. Uh, Deputy Brazel. Thank you, Chairman, and uh, welcome to um, the City and County Managers. Um, just a few questions. Um, the last census, do you have figures on empty properties? Um, I know we have it in, in Kerry, it, it's at 10,000, which is substantial. Um, so the, the solution in Kerry might be different to what it is in, in Dublin, but I'd still be interested to know, do you have figures in Dublin? And uh, with, with say the, the census that's coming up, or the, the, the results that were done from last Sunday night, um, I have a thought around um, giving the owners of empty houses an incentive to do them up, a grant scheme whereby those um, houses would be done up and then the, the, re, the return would be that the houses would be made, made available to yourselves for, for rent under a long-term lease or, or some such arrangement. So I'm just wondering, is there merit in pursuing such a proposal? Um, there certainly is in, in uh, rural counties, and I'm wondering, would it be beneficial in, in Dublin as well? Uh, my thought process being that to get something that's already built, renovated, is a lot quicker than starting from, from, from a greenfield. So I'd, I'd like your thoughts on, on that, and if it's worth pursuing, I think it's something that we should pursue. Um, the second question I'd have around homelessness is, I, it's just a question, what, what brings about homelessness? Is it is it repossession by banks? Is it landlords not renewing uh, tenancies? What is the key, the key driver of homelessness? And do we have a red flag system whereby a bank would contact the local authority and say there's X and Y uh, mortgages in arrears here? I think we could have a problem uh, coming up shortly. And in that case, do we have an ability to go in there and try and sort it out? Because to me, uh, letting a family become homeless becomes a very uh, expensive, cumbersome, difficult process for everybody, whereas if we could get in and solve it before the, the issue arises, I think it would be very beneficial. And it's just a question I have. Maybe we have, maybe we have something in place, and I, and I would hope if we don't, we put it in place. Um, the third question, a kind of an obvious one, is money a problem for you if you had more money available, could we solve the problem quicker? Um, and I, I think about the uh, anomalies that are around the country with regard to the local property tax, for example, whereby some local authorities give uh, a, a cut, and to me it's, it's of no huge value to the householder because it doesn't amount to any more than two or three euros a week per household. Whereas, for example, um, in Kerry, we kept it at uh, the set rate and we've an extra two million to invest. I believe in Dublin it would be as much as 15 million and I'm just asking the question would that money uh, go a long way to solving a lot of the problems. Um, and then the, the, the last thing is uh, around the tenant purchase scheme. Um, I, I've looked at it, I, I'm struggling with it. I, it seems to me that, that the people who qualify um, who can afford to, 
to buy the house rather simply don't qualify and the people who um, can't afford to buy the house do qualify so to me it's 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 a it's a nonsensical proposal and and I might add on to that is is there a need to have a tenant purchase scheme is it something that we want is this is it a model that we should move away from I mean you know that again if you go around any local authority estate, I would imagine that the majority of the voids there are ones that have been purchased and the parents have, have passed on and the children have moved away and the house is just lying there with, with really doing nothing. So I'm wondering, in long term, for our long term housing benefit, is a tenant purchase scheme something that we should be continuing with? Uh, I know that the Respondents and, and the housing associations don't have a, a purchase policy and they keep the houses. Um, for, for, for continued use, which you know might be something that needs to be considered. So that's my, okay. my thought. Mr. Cummins, uh, and briefly, Chairman, before I hand it over to Colin Morgan, just in relation to the numbers, significant numbers of vacant houses that there are across the country, and especially uh, holiday homes in Kerry and Clare, um, not everywhere there are vacant houses that there is a need. So um, we have to match the need where the need is. So we have a lot of unfinished estates, we have a lot of houses throughout the country, especially in the rural counties, um, but there's no need, there's no uh, need for the house, uh, there's no expressed need, so, and I like your idea in relation to maybe where there is a need, um, and if there were vacant houses, that they might be incentivised to get it back into the leasing market, I like that idea. In relation to the number of voids in Dublin and homelessness, I'll ask Cahill to, to take that, if you don't mind. Thank you. Uh, Deputy, in relation to the census, I think it makes eminent sense in order to use that data in order to see can we attract as much property um, within that sector into social use. Um, we will be cautious about using not the census just gone, but the census before that, because the data just may be just way too out of date, particularly in the Dublin region. Um, it's my understanding that census um, have agreed to issue a priority report on the basis of the recent census on th Sunday to make available data um, that will help housing authorities and approved housing bodies um, go after the property that's available. The other caution that we would have would be in relation to, um, we know that from our experience of constant campaigning around leasing arrangements, the housing assistance payment, local authorities are at this on a day-to-day -day basis, there have been numerous campaigns to try and attract properties from the private rental sector. Um, we have to face the fact that Dublin has very substantial constraints when it comes to making properties available. Just, that's just a fact of life, and that's going to be there for quite some time. Um, we have made huge efforts in relation to how we as a sector coordinate our access to the private rental sector. For example, in Dublin we've set up a unique what's called Dublin Place Finder service. So rather than um, numerous housing bodies and homeless services going after the same types of properties, contacting landlords, we have one unit that makes contact with all property owners. Um, there are six full-time staff that, on a day-to-day -day basis, they are trying to attract landlords into the housing assistance payment. I think it's fair to say there has been some success. We now, in Dublin, um, specifically under the Homelessness Remit, have just over 180, um, since late last year, housing assistance payments. So that has taken out a couple of hundred um, people out of the homeless system as a result of that. So just to answer the question, we will take the recent census data and we will do our best to try and go after the property insofar as it is available to us. In relation to the reasons of the, that um, households become homeless, um, everybody knows and everyone accepts that there isn't just one reason. It's a dynamic, it's a complex dynamic. It can range from um, households who have complex social and healthcare needs ranging from addiction to mental health and sometimes combined who may, for different reasons, not be able to manage their existing tenancies and sometimes fall out of their tenancies. Relationship breakdown, obviously, is a significant factor. We would say two things about that. One is that dynamic has absolutely shifted in the last couple of years. If you take the um, family presentations, it is the case that the vast majority of families that are coming to us are coming to us because their primary need is housing. It's very straightforward. There may be some concerns that are being raised in relation to managing day-to-day -day, uh, life and uh, particularly in relation to issues of income inadequacy and poverty has become a huge factor for families. Um, but the single biggest um, cause of concern as a result of that is the levels of insecurity within the private rental sector. 
Um, now, we are satisfied that there has been substantial change from the point of view of trying to put rent certainty, insofar as it is rent certainty, in place to help existing tenants. Um, but we know that, given the squeeze that's on the private rental sector, families are losing their private rental tenancies, sometimes going home, going into friends, and then not wanting to come to us, but then eventually end up on our, on our doorstep looking for emergency responses. We would obviously be an advocate for two other things which we think would help if we're looking at solutions. The mortgage to rent scheme obviously is something that we would like to see kept in place and expanded and improved upon. Um, we have also been on the record as calling for rent certainty measures, uh, sorry, for um, rent receiverships. Um, this is something that we would in particular be asking financial institutions to come on board with this. It, it, the principle here has to be the, we cannot have a situation where households are being made homeless. So if that's our working principle, to what degree can we change the current situation whereby if a mortgage gets into difficulty, if a landlord um, is renting their properties out and they get into difficulty, can we have rent receiverships where the family stays in place or they go into a mortgage to rent scheme where there can be at least a space provided to that household to give them breathing space to look at what the alternatives are over a period of time. It just doesn't make sense to us because what happens then is Obviously, if families become homeless, they end up, um, unfortunately, and we've always said this is absolutely unsustainable, they end up in uh, commercial hotel settings, um, where ultimately we pay more. So it makes sense for the state to be able to stand back and say, look, what can we do in order to alleviate this? I think it's important also to say that we haven't just been standing idly by, and we have had excellent cooperation with the Department of the Environment and the Department of Social Protection. We do, and I can only speak for the, the Dublin region this, in the, to this extent, we did establish a tenancy protection service in the Dublin region, which is now going to be spread out to the surrounding um, commuter belt, which is an early intervention whereby um, Threshold intervenes with the family. If the family is in difficulty in relation to paying their rent and their receipt of rent supplement, there is a direct intervention that's made with the Department of Social Protection. And we know since that initiative alone, it's not solving every problem, but obviously this is a huge calamity we're facing. But since that service was set up in 2014, 1,905 tenancies were protected as a result of that specific scheme. Um, obviously, it can't protect every tenancy from falling down because of the reasons I've just mentioned, such as receiverships, etc. Uh, Deputy Fergus O'Dowd. Uh, I'd just like to welcome the, the City Managers Association here. And it's clear from, your, from what you're saying that you've obviously put a lot of thought into, into, into the area of his housing. I have a few questions. Uh, for, one is just one you could come back to. Best practice elsewhere. What has happened in other jurisdictions, in local authorities in the United Kingdom or wherever? Obviously, we shouldn't and we can't invent the wheel. This has happened before, even in Ireland. It happened in the 70s. It happened, uh, you know, in, in the United Kingdom after the Second World War. And if you guys, if, if it's possible, at a later stage, if you could send us, you know, what what your research tells you is, is, is systems or schemes that worked. Uh, and on that very point, uh, one thing that strikes me, looking at the 1911 census, the number of people who lived in the centre of towns and over shops and businesses, that's practically gone, certainly in Drogheda and Dundalk. Uh, would it make sense uh, to have an attractive scheme, tax incentivised, to allow developers or owners of those properties to upgrade that those properties to um, apartment or you see the problem is going to be the physical size and the shape and the type of those buildings but provided that they meet fire regulations is there any reason why we couldn't fast track planning you know in town centres uh, and clearly that would help uh, single applicants you know uh, childless couples or whatever it wouldn't necessarily obviously suit families with young children but it seems to me that's an obvious uh, place that, that we, we could make a significant difference. The other question I want to ask, uh, some years ago there was a scheme where local authority tenants could be particularly assisted to buy homes outside of their actual <coughs> In other words, I'm a local authority tenant, I'm working, I have X amount of money saved, uh, but I can't make, maybe I can't make the 10%, and I know families like that. Uh, is, is there a case, would you think, is there a case we made where uh, people who, could, who you'd obviously have to do the affordability test could get a significant grant to help them buy a home? Uh, and, and that could mean in some cases either it would leave pressure 
in an existing or they could hand their ha house back to the local authority you know with, with, with a significant uh, you know if they, if they vacate the, the tenancy um, is, 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 is that worth looking at um, and I agree with the comments other people have made in relation to empty homes which is a hugely important uh, a hugely important point the last question I, I would like to ask you basically um, is that and I, I'll just say it in one sentence many housing applicants that come to me are concerned about the treatment they get in local authorities. Now, it's not personal to any place or time. It's the fact that they have to go to a hatch, that other people can overhear their conversations. Uh, or if they're homeless, you know, in other words, in some areas, there are hatches where people have to do their business in public and everybody can hear their problems. And I, I, I don't like that. I think it should end. Uh, and perhaps your association might have a view on that. But the other point is, when people are homeless, the question was asked, you know, who or what causes homelessness? The question is a different question to ask. If somebody's homeless on a Friday afternoon, as they were in Drogheda in my office last Friday, and through no fault of their own, there's nobody in the council who can make a decision on that case on a Friday afternoon, and that person ends up homeless again for that weekend, you know, how do you ensure, should we not insist, that, a, you know, that there is, in cases like that, that there is a, a system in place where they can be, decisions can be made in, re, in relation to those cases. And the very last part of that is sometimes some local authorities can put applicants into, into hostels or into, um, into hotels. Some local authorities don't do that. Now, the department assures me that there's no reason uh, that the funding is there to put somebody into a place of safety, and that doesn't necessarily happen. And you know, do you see any changes that there ought to be in relation to uh, homelessness? There should be uniformity of treatment across all local authorities, regardless of who or what or where you're from, that you have the same positive reception to your needs, and that there's no door closed against you uh, for any technical reason or, or any other reason. Mr. Cummins. Again, um, and I'm just conscious that the Deputy Browser just in relation to questions on internet purchase and, uh, and the vet is one of your problems, so maybe we might come back to that as well. In relation to Deputy Dowd's question, questions uh, specifically in relation to best practice, we have looked at best practice uh, across Europe and indeed the UK, uh, but our main difficulty here, and, I, and, I, and you know, Chairman, um, it's very hard for us as a sector, as a local authority sector, to have the broader conversation, and we're here to assist, and to come back again if necessary, uh, to have the conversation without emphasising we on our own cannot solve the problem. You know, we have to have the private sector, and we have looked at, like, at, looked at best practice, but across the world we didn't have that almost, you know, that, that stopping of, of the private sector building. And sorry, I'll, I'll let uh, Dick uh, come in on that as well. Sorry, uh, Chair. The, the other issue was opposed in, in comparing the system in the Republic of Ireland with the rest of Europe is that we operate on a differential rent system uh, and the rest would operate on either on a commercial rent or some form of affordable rent uh, uh, systems. Now, that, that is, is, is an extremely important point to make because Differential rent is based on the ability to pay. It's not based on the ability to maintain the properties or the costs of the service. So that if you are looking for uh, best practices or if you want to examine uh, how we might change things into the future, it may require us to look at the basic uh, principle of the differential rent and that if somebody is in need of support, that there may be other ways in which that support can be uh, given, uh, except through the, you know, save through the, the differential rent system. Uh, sorry. Yeah, uh, thanks for that. And, and just uh, getting back to Deputy Dow, to, to, your, to your many questions um, and, and, and important questions, especially in relation to incentivising, uh, you know, in the centre of towns and over, over, properties. The first thing, we have to be very careful that, you know, obviously there has to be a very strong need identified uh, in wherever area it is, whatever town it is. And secondly then, that if we are having incentives that they're, that they're specifically targeted to an area, to a town, and to the renting 
you know, that there's no point doing up a building unless it's going to be made available to rent or lease, whether it's to the AHBs or to ourselves. It doesn't matter. Uh, and indeed to the private sector. It doesn't matter, provided it's there. And there is a uh, certain merit in that, and I think that's a great idea. And maybe incentives in, in, in specific targeted areas where new builds in places where there is a need um, in terms of incentivising possibly, something you might look at, uh, I'd suggest, that in terms of incentivising developers uh, who are building new properties uh, for to rent. And uh, that's something um, that I think would be worth looking at as well. In terms of giving grants, to, you know, to, 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 we, we just need to be careful in that because we, we cannot fuel the market. And you know, it's, 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 it's supply versus demand and the market is very sensitive to supports and subsidies. And we have all know the mistakes that were made in the past and we have to be very careful that we don't go there again. Um, just found that we did have a scheme years ago where a local authority tenant could actually get a significant grant and I'm speaking about a specific category person and with, with the income to sustain obviously buying the property but it made the difference between them being able to buy a home uh, or not. Yeah, maybe Billy do you want to come in there as well? Yeah I, and, and I suppose uh, if, if you don't mind Chair I'll refer back to uh, Deputy Braz's um, query about the tenant purchase scheme as well because they are very much interlinked here. We, we've you know we had an experience of disincentivization before uh, and unfortunately it worked f for a lot of people it didn't work um, and, and it affected communities. Um, oh, strong I just have to disagree with you on that because I, well, uh, I remember it well because I remember lots of people. It's about 20, 30 years ago it happened. But anyway, I suppose that's the history. Yeah. You know, we put the questions. Yeah, it'll no, be up to, it'll that, be up yeah. to the committee afterwards to draw our of own course. conclusions and analysis. But oh, I uh, accept that. I accept that. Yeah. Thank but you. I don't like um, it just being shut down. Just like that. It's not being shut down. It's been explained. So <laughs> well, uh, no, but. Sorry, yeah. Sorry to, um, yeah, I'm certainly not shooting you down, <laughs> Deputy. Uh, I'm, I'm, just giving you, I'm just giving you an experience that I have, and, and I've seen it, and I've seen it very strongly, where strong people within communities who could afford to move did move, despite the, the incentiveness that came with it. However, linked with that is the tenant purchase scheme over many years, and there have been many, and that is the affording of people, and strong people, in communities to stay within that community but to own the home uh, and it's seen as an opportunity itself. In terms of the incremental purchase scheme, um, you know I, th I think what we have to remember there are enough safeguards I I'm convinced within that in terms of exclusions. You would quite rightly ask why sell local authority stock at a time when we have a shortage of social housing. Um, but I think Apart from that, we have to keep strong people who can afford it and who want to get on the home ownership, and we can provide for that. That's important. But within the scheme itself, there are quite a number of exclusions that can be applied. That can keep, for example, you know, you could exclude all your one beds because you do need one beds. In terms of homelessness, that's the biggest category of need is, is single units. Um, an area that we maybe should be looking at is the number of social housing units which we have, um, which may three, four, two, three and four bedrooms are only one person living in step down. And I think we have to look at the provision of that step down in offering a very safe um, and secure place for people of a, of a like mind, happy to move closer to services, closer to public transport, to shopping, but to live together in a more safe and I think that will free up some stock. Thank you. Uh, Deputy Coppinger. Uh, thank you, Kerlock. Um, yeah, I suppose it, there's, there's so many questions, I'll try to distill them into the time we have. Um, I suppose the first question will be, why is it taking so long to produce housing? And why so few, um, I suppose, in relation to Dick Brady? I think uh, Mr Brady mentioned it would take two and a half years normally for development to come about just a few moments ago. Why though, why does it take that long if the council owns the land? Um, you mentioned as well, you know, 22 weeks for modular houses to, to be brought about. But for example, I dispute that it should take that long for housing developments to come about. And I want to hear what the obstacles are. I'm not doubting what you're saying, but we, we need to hear what they are because that's the purpose of this committee. There's an estate being built half a mile from me called Hollywood Rath in Tyrrellstown. 
um, and the housing started in September and was finished in December. It was built in three months because it was timber framed housing and then the rest of the work was just uh, put up. And it's for sale, been advertised for sale now. So if, if they can build it so quickly, I'm just wondering why permanent homes can't be built so, so quickly as well. I suppose the other question is, why are the targets so low for the local authorities? I had a meeting recently with Fingal Housing Director, <coughs> and the manager assured us they were reaching their targets. But that scares me that they're reaching their targets and we have a homeless epidemic in parts of Fingal. So, for example, in the, your presentation, um, there's 25,000 on the housing list in Dublin City Council, I think. But the target for 2015 to 17 is for only 3,347 new units. That's in laying the foundations, the document, the minister's document on page 15. That's across all schemes, including private rental, acquisitions, everything. Um, it would only impact on 21% of the Dublin City Council's housing list in the documents on the government's website. So we have these really low targets that the councils are able to reach, but they're not actually doing anything for the housing crisis. Um, it's the same in all the Dublin local authorities and in the other commuter belt authorities, if you like, where the crisis is most worse, if you like, Wick, Local, Dare, places like that. So 21%, 23% in Dublin City Council, 23% in Fingal, 23% in South Dublin County Council. Like, the targets are too low. That's the, the problem. And why the management are expressing that they've enough money is beyond me. Like in your presentation that, the, that uh, Mr Cummins gave, he says um, that there is enough money. But it's not working, so why would it be enough? Um, just also this idea of dependence on the private sector, which you have invoked a lot today, uh, Mr Cummins, to provide affordable, secure housing. Like to me, it's clearly failing and it hasn't worked. Can you clarify what you meant on page three? Or page four, you say, unless the private sector builds, we can't, we, we have to, the problem will worsen. And then on page three, you said, we can only build 10 to 15%. Can you explain that? Are you saying that the local authorities are only allowed to build 10 to 15% of social housing? Were you referring there to passing it to housing agencies, or what did you mean? because these are the, the obstacles that we need to know about to, to try to, to overcome. Um, in the RTEs This Week programme on March 27th, where they were investigating housing, they said that propose, processes to find <coughs> off-balance sheet funding for thousands of social housing units has failed. Um, so in other words, if you are waiting for the private sector to provide the housing as a county manager, I think you're going to be disappointed. Um, the other question is why capital funding is still so low in all the targets. Um, capital funding to actually build houses. So in the uh, department's website, uh, 500 million will be allocated this year for, for capital spend. In 2008, it was 1.45 billion. So it's a third of what it was in 2008. And yet we've got a housing crisis beyond belief since that time. So um, uh, I, I just wonder why management are saying that they're happy enough with the amounts of money that they're getting. And lastly, just on the modular housing, I'm wondering why valuable council land is being taken up with temporary housing. I know solutions have to be found. I know how desperate the situation is. But why is the council proceeding with expensive modular homes in Finglas and Poppentry and in other places like Fingal, when, as reported in the Dublin People, for example, there's about 40 houses for sale, for example, on a property website, ranging from 115,000 to 200,000. So they're costing less than the modular houses. I'm wondering why there isn't more emphasis on going and acquiring them for an immediate you know, acquisition. And likewise, in Dublin 17, there's properties for sale for as little as 80,000. In Dublin 10, there's 14 homes on the market with an average price of 150,000. In Dublin 12, there was 20 homes for sale under the 200,000 mark. So they're cheaper than modular homes. And I'm just wondering why they're not being gone after. And 
Uh, similarly with affordable housing, I, I don't think we should say, oh, affordable housing is up to the private sector. There was a role played in the past by the local authorities. I live in an affordable house myself that I bought off a local authority. And I would like to see that vacuum being filled by the local authorities to provide workers who can't get on the social housing list, who are being screwed with really high rents of 14, 15 and even 2,000. Um, it's just the manager said that uh, in his presentation that he felt that that was up to the private sector, but I hope you don't think that the local authorities or the, or the public sector can play a role in that. Um, can I just say with um, Mr Morgan, I think it's difficult for us to raise some of the questions we'd like to have to him. Well, we can come back. You, but maybe he could come back on another well, we can, when we're doing we, the, we can address that separately, but when everybody has had an opportunity, there would be further time available. So. Because there are key issues with the placement service in Dublin, and I, that we would, but it's difficult in this time. So, um, Mr. Brady, yes. fairly wide-ranging uh, um, list of list of questions. There, I suppose we'll start off with the two and a half to three years, and uh, you know the, the development at uh, Hollywood Rat that took three months. I suppose before that got to go, get the go, it had to go to planning permission. Somebody had to find finance etc, etc, etc. So you'll probably find, if you look at that, it, there was a, a, a long lead-in in relation, in, relation, uh, in relation to that. Our uh, modular units, our rapid building units, they're not temporary houses, they're regular houses. You know, they have a... Lifespan of 30 years. They have a lifespan of 60 years. 60. So 60 so years, temporary. yeah. So it's not temporary, no. That's a, a regular house. And I think all of the... Uh, I'm not mistaken, I think all of the elected representatives in the Dublin region were invited out to have a, a look at the units to, to, uh, to see for themselves what we're talking about. So we're not talking about temporary houses. In fact, the houses that you mentioned up at Hollywood Rat are probably using the same construction method that's been used in the rapid houses in, in uh, Ballymun. So these are good quality A-rated houses fit for families are fit for families. Uh, so that's the first thing. They are not temporary. And if I get that message across today, I'd, I'd be... Uh, well, I'd, sorry, Mr. Are they transient, though, aren't they? They're for people to move well, in and out. Well, let's look at that, then, if yeah. you want. That's a different thing altogether. Where did we start with this? Two years ago, we saw uh, ourselves in the City Council and in the, the homeless uh, executive that we had a problem coming over the hill. We saw families being made homeless and the only places that we could put them was into hotels. We agreed at that time with our elected members and, uh, and I suppose everybody that hotels are not suitable places for families to be brought up and we needed to do something about it. We had a three-pronged strategy. Part one, keep people in their properties for as long as they could. In order to do that, we made two suggestions. One, rent receivers. Two, uh, was to uh, give advice to people in order to help them to stay there. Our threshold uh, uh, advice uh, inter intervention. The second thing then was to uh, come up with an intermediate solution that would get rapid build, so to get people into homes that they could uh, live in whilst we got on with the second part of the operation, which was finding them, uh, uh, what would you call it, more suitable accommodation for their needs. So the use of these units, what people are call, calling transient, are in fact units that are going to be put in place in order for us to keep people in humane conditions, families in humane conditions, while we find them alternative accommodation. I don't think there's anything more transient than a hotel room. And if you ask me, I think the move towards rapid build and to use the rapid build in the matter that I've said is a far better proposition for the citizens and to the families and the children of this country. Um, i move on then. Targets. The local authorities don't operate in a vacuum. All the targets that we're operating to uh, come from the government's housing strategy, social housing strategy to 2020. And each local authority has been given its portion of those units to, uh, to provide. Uh, and part of that, that strategy shows some 75,000 units being provided through the 
private sector by means of leasing, HAP, RAS, or some other variation. So that's the framework in which we're working in. When the managers tell you that they're meeting their targets, they're meeting the targets as set by government. Uh, just, uh, where am I going here now? Uh, and also, I suppose, in relation to money, the state has uh, financed uh, that particular that particular program. Uh, and it's worth also, when we talk about money, to understand that you know the country collapsed sometime around 2008, and the amount of money available to the state in order to to uh, put into housing and indeed other essential services was extremely limited. It's only in recent times that we're starting to see some sort of an uplift and some space in which the government can move, move, uh, can move, I suppose, uh, money. Um, somebody asked a question of the process of off-balance sheet. Um, I, think, I think that was part of the, your, your question, the off-balance sheet borrowing uh, um, and so forth. Again, you know, the, uh, the state... I don't, has, has bought in to a fiscal compact with, the, uh, with our European partners. We have made agreements with the EU and the IMF in relation to uh, borrowing and the, the state's borrowing. And we in local authorities are just as much, uh, uh, what would you call it, caught up in that or have to abide by those rules as, as the state. Uh, and, you know, those rules... Uh, can have and are having some problems in relation to uh, housing finance. I think, did I get everything here? Uh, Deputy O'Brien. Thanks, uh, uh, Chair, and thanks for the presentations. <coughs> I have four short questions and, and three kind of bigger questions. Just in relation to the presentation, it references 8,000 HAP tenancies. Do you know what percentage of those are new tenancies and what percentage are just rollovers from rent supplements, so people living in the same property but changing payment? And when you talk about a target of 10,000 HAPs for next year, is that an extra 2,000 or 10,000 on top of the 8,000, just for clarity? In relation to the NAMA units, you said 2,000 units. Are they tenanted units or are there people living in those? Um, uh, and if not, do you know how many? Uh, Carl, uh, you, I know you're not able to tell us the outcome of the rough sleepers count because you're processing it, but are you in a position to give us an indication as to whether it's up or down on last year? Because obviously last year's was down, not last year, the last... Uh, half year was down on the previous and Dick in relation to, to Poppentry and I'm one of those people who thinks we should stop calling them modular homes because they are timber frame unlike the original modulars that were presented in early stage and it's an important difference what is concerning some of us however is the potential cost and, and there's all sorts of figures flying around and I'm just wondering are you in a position to clarify the issue that was in RT about a week or so ago of the extra half a million euros and if that was related to the construction and, and cost or if it was related to something else because that would help clarify all of that. The three substantive questions and, and I suppose what this committee is going to try and do is make a report to make recommendations to how to improve things. So we're not looking uh, for people to come in and criticise some other agency or some other body but we are trying to identify weaknesses in the system so that we can then say uh, to the doll and hopefully then to the government, uh, these are things that would could change and would be helpful. So there's three particular areas I'm interested in you commenting on, uh, whoever is most appropriate. In relation to the new build programmes, what most of us don't understand is what happens between when the Part 8 is agreed and the key is turned. We just don't understand. Nobody has ever explained what those processes are. I think it would be really helpful if one of you would talk us through what that process is. I mean, Dick, you mentioned kind of et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Clearly, you guys know. We'd like to know that because it seems to me that is one of the problems that a committee like this could usefully look at to see how can we shorten that. I mean, particularly if, if we're saying it's two to three years from when a local authority decides we think it'd be good to have houses here to when those houses are opened, and yet it takes six months to do the timber frames, you know, surely procurement is of a similar nature in relation to both of those. Surely the requirements in terms of how you spend are the same. So how is it that we can do timber frames in six months, but brick houses take us three years? Uh, and I just think that would be helpful for us. The second is large-scale projects. Like all the talk, and those of us that have just come from local authorities, we've been passing through part eights that are 10 units, 15 units, whatever. 
you know, Sartre County Council, and Billy knows because uh, I've pickled his poor head over this, there's 44 acres of land in the Grange in Bawn Oak, prime land uh, for social housing. Uh, and it's caught up in discussions around public-private partnerships that seem to be interminable. Is it the case that local authorities are not in a position to put larger scale proposals to the department, which would at least circumvent some of the difficulties with the private sector investing? Uh, and is that something that this committee should be looking at to say, well, if there is 44 acres of land and if you could have units in the multiples of, of hundreds rather than tens, is that not something we could look at? The third is acquisitions. Obviously, it takes, no matter how long uh, uh, or how quickly you shorten the process, building the units from planning to turnkey takes time. But there are, and Ruth mentioned it, lots of units out there. Many are in local authority estates uh, that are on the private market. Uh, so of your uh, funding allocations, for example, for the first three years of, of uh, the 2020 strategy, I mean, there's almost you know, 300 million to Dublin City Council and 75 million to South Dublin County Council. How much of that can be spent on acquisitions of properties that are turnkey ready? Uh, has the department set a limit? Can you guys spend as much of that as you want? Uh, is there an argument to say where properties, for example, uh, are stuck uh, in all sorts of legal difficulties but would be valuable social housing units? Could CPOs be used? You know, is that a way of increasing the units? Because clearly if you can buy a unit that's turnkey ready, that's quicker than even a timber frame home. So I'm interested in that. Uh, the last is the refurbs. Um, are there units out there in, in the local authorities you're aware of that could be referred but central government won't provide the funding for because it's above whatever the limit is? Is that an avenue we should be pursuing? The last thing I want to say is, is just, um, Eugene, in relation to your, your emphasis on the private sector, uh, and I know you're not going to uh, agree with this or comment on it, but just to put it out there, part of the problem uh, in terms of, of the over-reliance on the private sector is that under the government strategy, 80% of the units that you guys have as targets are units that will be in the private sector. I mean, if you look at the new builds, for example, for South Dublin and for Dublin City, they represent 17% in both instances of the total of your targets. Throw in a few extra refurbs and a few acquisitions, you know, it's only 20%. So I'd like you to answer, but I know you won't. Would it not be helpful if the targets that you guys were given by central government wasn't just 20% direct provision by local authorities and housing associations, but 40 or 80%, and then you guys could get on with the, the business of it? If the money is there, surely that would be a better way of delivering those units. Thank you, Chair. Well, Chairman, before I invite my colleagues in, there are a, a, a few significant questions there, and indeed, uh, Councillor Kenny broached on it as well. There, there are significant land available to local authorities um, that we've bought over the years, uh, but because of sustainable communities that I have listed here in the presentation, um, it's not possible nor desirable to, to, to build out large tracts of lands for social housing only. Um, it, it, you know, it, it, history would show us that you know it causes. You need a good social mix, and uh, we have to be very careful that we go on, don't go on that road again. And I know it's very tempting to go out there and get maybe 40 acres and build social houses. But that will create untold difficulties. It's unfair, it's inequitable, and uh, it has caused huge problems in the past. So when we're building out lands, especially in rural areas, uh, not so much the cities, uh, we need to be careful that there's a good mix of properties there. And sustainable communities, as it's referenced in the document, you know, we have to have full regard of that. Um, and in relation to... Um, you know, the, the local authorities, and I know Deputy Cop Coppinger mentioned it as well. You know, um, at the end of the day, local authorities are not developers. We're developers in some instances, but in the, in, in the strict sense, we are not developers. And uh, if we were to build out, you know, what we could over the next two, as soon as possible, it'll improve the situation, but it won't solve the problem. And uh, even, you know, when all the properties that were available, over 20,000 of them after the collapse, We've bought most of those, and the properties that were available to buy and good value for money, we have purchased most of those. And the ones that are left, are left, they're either not in an area of need or they're not suitable for other reasons, maybe not properly built or maybe other issues with them. So we have had due regard to all of that, and we've purchased most of those. In relation to the, the, the HAP questions, um, I'd like uh, Billy Coleman to, to, to deal with that. Um, I, I suppose, Deputy, your, your question is, um, the expectation is 10,000 in 2016. That is a mix of new and transfer of existing rental supplement. That's 10,000 on top of the existing 8,000. 
So extra 10,000 tenancies. Yeah, 8,000 delivered in, in, in 2015. Yeah. Um, there is uh, a move to um, deal with the existing rental supplement um, uh, tenants um, and transfer those to HAP. That's going to be ramped up, and it'll be ramped up by particularly the Wave 1 authorities during this year. And to be quite percentage honest... Percentage of the 8,000 that are transfers from rent supplement? Yeah. Um, it, it's, it's quite low at the moment. I will say that. Yeah, to give you 25%. an exact... 25%? It's about 20. I think nationally it's about 20. But I, I will confirm that. I'll come back to you on that. Um, as, yeah, I, I suppose there was a reference as well. I think it's important to realise that we look at all options. We have to. Um, the housing construction build was only really got kick-started where the funding became available in 2015. And it does take time for, you know, local authorities since 2008 weren't in the house building game. It took a long time to build up that expertise and get the necessary expertise back in there again. It was identifying... Um, ideal sites, the proper locations, uh, and granted, Deputy, I take your point, there's a lot of infill in there, but these are ones that we can turn around, and we're in areas where we do have a housing need as well, um, and to turn those around as quickly as possible. This is started in 2015, and it is realistically going to be 2017 and, the, and into 2018 before we will realise the new construction and new construction build. In the meantime, there are other avenues and options we're looking at. HAP is one. Um, acquisitions is very much part of it. And closer collaboration, I think um, Mr Cummins did mention it quite a bit through, through his uh, presentation. Collaboration. Local authorities are, not, are only one of sto the stakeholders. The approved housing bodies are an important uh, and vital cog in the strategy itself in delivering social housing. Uh, and, and there is that collaboration is getting stronger all the time in delivering that. They can borrow, you know, as one of the, the avenues. They can borrow, which we can't, to construct. But we we're working with them in, for the Dublin region. Um, we've, we have now developed a, a series of protocols of working together uh, under four different streams directly with the Irish Council of Social Housing to ensure that they have the capacity and the ability to deliver as well to and, and strong role that they have to play in terms of that. There has been a reliance on the private sector for centuries and, and that hasn't changed. You may say there's an over-reliance on the private sector, and you know it's, it's within your gift to say that. Um, whether I agree with that or not, I don't think that's the matter. What matters for me to say, however, there is a strategy which has and continues the reliance on the, proper, the private sector. They have delivered heretofore. However, what is needed is stronger regulation in terms of that and security of tenure. There are two avenues that have to be explored. Yes. Just in relation to the process that Deputy brought well, Maybe we come back on the, the puppetry thing. I suppose there's a limit to, to the amount that I can say or about that at the moment, given that the final account hasn't been agreed in relation to the site, uh, and given that we have a, another uh, procurement process on the way in relation to the balance. So it, would be, um, it wouldn't be proper to, to say anything. But what I will say is, as soon as the... Uh, the final accounts are agreed. Uh, all of those those figures and numbers, I would gladly uh, put out to the to the general public uh, for for scrutiny. So there's, there's no issue. Uh, Mr. Hughes, something further just, to add? Can I? Oh, sorry. Yeah, sorry. Just in relation to the procurement and yes. why it takes so long. So just to the, the stage, in relation yeah. to the to the uh, the rapid build housing. The first 100. Well, I'm sure you, you you know this, but the the government when they made their decision back in September, or sorry, October of 2015 uh, to move with rapid build housing, decided that the first uh, 150 or thereabouts uh, would be using an ultra-fast procurement system uh, and the balance of 350 would be uh, using normal procurement. Um, when I say normal procurement, in fact, that has changed somewhat, and is that the, the OGP are, are, are working on a framework in relation to that. In relation to the first 130, or 150, the city manager, in accordance with the, the Planning uh, Act, 
under a section, I think it's 179, said that having people in hotels and getting them out of hotels was a, an emergency and invoked emergency planning in order to uh, move forward with the first 100 and, uh, 150 units. It's my understanding that the second uh, 350, that tranche, will move in the normal, the normal uh, planning arena. So it was in order to address this, this issue of families in hotels that the city manager said that we had an emergency planning situation. So therefore, if you marry an emergency planning situation with an ultra-fast procurement system, you get a condensed, uh, if you like, first half of the, uh, of the, of the game, which, which made it extremely short. Okay? In relation to the normal sort of uh, procurement, if you can call it, call it that, there are about five different stages that you have to go through in order to get to the, in order to get to the end, if you like, of the thing. And those stages would include, you know, first of all, a proposal has to be has to be developed. That proposal then has to be taken and approved by the department. It comes back from there, and then you have to draw up and get ready for the uh, part eight. Uh, proposal. So the Part 8 proposal gets done and that goes to council and you know yourself that that takes, uh, that's the planning side of things. When the Part 8 comes back then you have to go into drawing up tender documentation, uh, you have to carry out a cost benefit analysis, you have to uh, you know, sort of price the job. All of that gets sent down to the department for, uh, for approval. Uh, and, you know, there's bits of to and fro in relation to that. So when that's then approved, that comes back. Uh, so now you have the drawing, so then you go out to tender. So it goes out to tender at that stage. It comes back from tender. The analysis of the tender has to be carried out and a recommendation provided. That then goes down to the department and the department then approves you to go ahead. So that comes back down to you then. You carry out your due diligence in relation to the, uh, the, the what would you call it, the winning uh, tender. And at that stage, you, away you go. Okay. A supplementary question. Just Could I come back to you? Because there's they're directly related to the two bits of quickly, information. Because there's eight people is, still. Very quickly. Is, is there any reason why the sped up procurement process for the rapid build couldn't be used for regular part eight once the planning is through? That's the first thing. And the second thing is, it, specifically in relation to, to Eugene's point, is there anything preventing a local authority putting in a proposal for a large-scale development with social housing, cost rental and affordable housing to get the income mix that government policy requires, but to produce much larger numbers of units? I mean, is that something that could be done, and is there any obstacle to it? I'll answer part of it. So, uh, in relation to the Part 8 is a particular planning process. So, if you want to, to dispel dispense with that, as I say, the way it was, the way it was handled, in, it was handled in, in relation to what was seen to be an emergency. It's and the it post-planning bit I'm, wor I'm be, asking about. It had to be declared an emergency. Now, in relation to the next piece, the question you asked there in relation to mixed uh, tenure, really, is what you're talking about. You do know that the City Council has been trying for the last uh, 12 months or thereabouts through an uh, initiative called the Land Initiative to develop three sites uh, which have the potential to produce about 13, about, yeah, about 1,300 units. Uh, and we're in the process of moving that along. Uh, and I suppose it, 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 it's, it is moving along, but there are concerns being expressed by some, in, from some quarters, I suppose. There are uh, places and, and communities adjacent to some of these uh, uh, what would you call it, uh, proposed developments, who were extremely worried in relation to the scale of some of these uh, uh, developments, even though the, the attempt is to produce social housing alongside, uh, 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 alongside owner-occupier and alongside another type of, of, of uh, tenure that we're trying to develop because we see a piece gap, if you like, out there, where we have families who are not uh, in line for social housing, but they cannot afford to go into 
the purchasing of properties and we see some form of affordable renting mixed into that so you could have what we're calling public housing which would be a mixture of uh, affordable rental and social housing uh, supplemented by uh, purchase units. So we'd be, we're, we're working on that and I suppose we would be uh, hoping to uh, bring proposals to our, to our own council uh, in relation to one of those sites. So